Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here. Welcome to this worship this third Sunday in Lent. It's wonderful having people in the sanctuary as we were filming when it was all virtual. I didn't know whether to look at the Facebook or look up there at the camera, but now I look at y'all, and that's what is going to be great. Maybe even next week we'll have a few more people. But I know there's some people that still aren't comfortable coming, so hey, we're still recording, and so if you are worshiping uh, virtually, please make a comment so we know that you're on there. And for those in the sanctuary, I wish you would, I'd like for you to sign the attendance pads like we were before. Um, we're, we're still keeping our protocols in place. I got my mask here. And um, if you sign the attendance, then we know who's been here that very Sunday. So I would appreciate that. Um, follow, continue to follow all the safety protocols. Um, if, if you really, really, really want to sing, you can sing into your mask, I guess, but just be careful because I think people are spaced out pretty good, but just be careful. Also, for our offering, again, we're still collecting it as you come in, so I will pray, and then the ushers will come forward as Gus plays the doxology, and Emily will sing it, and we'll sing it. It's the old 100. Um, tomorrow, we're going to go back and start our Lenten Bible study, and I was asked by the group to go back to the book that we were that we only did a couple of chapters in last year during Lent. It's final words, the final words that Jesus said on the cross. And so we will start, start that at 1030 in the education parlor tomorrow. Be sure and wear your mask. Let us continue our worship service. Good morning, everybody. And it is great to see everybody back in church. Maybe not everybody but we're getting there. It's a great feeling. In Sunday school this morning, we described the gatherings at church as being like family, and that's what we are. We love each other, we care about each other, and most importantly, we need to see each other from time to time. And maybe, gingerly, exchange the greetings that we used to love to do in this church. What if all our words were pleasing to God? Might we then discover wisdom and thereby change the world? And let us pray. God of glory and might, speak to us with your wisdom that we might truly hear you. Display your majesty that we might truly see you. Transform the chaos of our lives with the clarity of your call and voice that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen.
seated. The epistle lesson is from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. If you want to follow in the Pew Bible, it's at page 991. And this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will thwart. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not go, know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would any of our children like to come down now? I guess I'll get them. Yeah, you wear your mask and be socially distant from me because I can't talk with my mask on. Oh, what? Is my mic not on? Oh, they're coming down. Okay, I'll wait. Why don't you sit over wherever? We got a couple coming down. Some of you that have not been able to watch us on Facebook, you may say, well, why you got your bench all the way up there, Sarah, your little stool? You were down there. Well, with us filming, they couldn't get me all the way. So um, you guys are going to sit there. Yeah, now you got to look at me. Is, is your brother coming? Oh, okay. Oh, but I saw him. Oh, here he comes. Yay! I'm so glad to have you guys with me today. Okay. Okay, now pretend if I had a mop and a broom and some window cleaner, what would I be getting ready to do? Clean? Clean? Well, gosh, you're pretty good. Cleaning to get ready for God to come over. You're going to find out that probably is a lot to do with our scripture. Excellent, excellent. But I'd be cleaning. Now, do y'all ever use those things and help your parents clean the house? Sometimes. You probably straighten up your room, don't you? Not a mop. Use a broom, not a mop. Probably a good idea. Well, I'll tell you some signs when it's time for you to start cleaning the house. When your feet stick to the floor when you walk through the kitchen. Has that ever happened to y'all? You guys got good house cleaners at your house. It's time to clean the house when your mom can't find you when she comes into your room to wake you up in the morning. There's a cartoon in the comic page called Zitz. He's a teenager. And a lot of times his room is so filled up with dirty clothes and old food. Ugh. It's time to clean the house when the kids in the neighborhood use their fingers to write, wash me in the dirt on your window. Have you ever seen somebody do that to a car? Like a big back window on a car and it's real dirty and somebody uses their fingers to write, wash me. How about this one? It's time to clean the house when there are more dishes in the sink 
than there are in the cab. I put mine in the dishwasher, but you know. Yeah, and also it's time coming out when you have enough dust bunnies under your bed that you could start a bunny farm. That's what we call all the clumps of dust that fly all over the place, dust bunnies. So you guys get the idea what I'm talking about. So I'm going to tell you a story about how Jesus did some house cleaning. It was time for the annual Passover celebration, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. When he went into the temple, he couldn't believe what he saw. People were selling cattle and sheep and doves that they could be used as sacrifice in the temple. Some men were even charging people to change their money so they could pay their temple tax. It really looked more like a flea market than a place to worship God. Well, we don't see Jesus very angry throughout the Bible, do we? But in this instance, he was angry. He made a whip from rope and he drove the cattle and the sheep and those who were selling them out of the temple. He turned over the money changer tables. And to the ones who were selling the doves, he said, Get out of here. How dare you turn my father? into a market. And what did he tell me at the very beginning? He said to clean the house to get ready for God to come. What Jesus said was, well, what he did that day was some serious house cleaning, house cleaning to prepare the place for God. You know, we talk about Jesus cleaning the temple, but maybe there's other cleaning that needs to be done. You know, the Bible talks about us as a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God lives in us. So during this season, it's a good time for us to think about cleaning our hearts so we can really hear what God has to say even better. Let's pray. God, help us to remember that we are your temple and that your Spirit lives in us. Help us to keep our lives clean and useful for service to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being here today. You can go back to your seats now. Thank you. I got to keep looking at the bulletin to make sure I do stuff in the right order because it does, we did it, some of it a little bit different when we were just doing virtual. For our prayer concerns, praises and concerns, I have several I want to lift up to you. I ask that you please pray for the family of George Matthews. George passed away last Monday, and the family had a private graveside service. Also, we lift up prayers for Alan Jackson and family. His daughter Carrie passed away a week before last and her service was last Sunday, February 28th. Continue to be in prayer for Eleanor Pesci, Lonnie Baucom, Elwood Green, Lib Huntley, and Dot Huntley. We also pray for all those that are fighting cancer, that are going through treatments, and for their families and their caregivers. And also we continue to lift up prayer for those that have been infected with COVID, just because the numbers are leveling off doesn't mean we slack off. We need to still be very careful, wash our hands, wear our masks, and stay distanced from everyone. Please, do it for the other person. To show the love, the love that we learn from God. We also ask for continued prayers for all those that are on our prayer list. And there are also some anonymous prayers that have been shared with me. Let us go to God in prayer at this time. Almighty God, when we set up barriers that prevent others from knowing the truth of your love, forgive us and break down those walls. When we set up barriers in our own minds and lives that keep us from knowing the truth of your love, Break down our walls with your grace. When we are confused by the world's wisdom, 
Break through our muddled minds and shine the clarity of your teaching. Draw us ever closer to you, to one another, and to the beauty of your wisdom and your love. In the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we pray all this. The names that we have mentioned out loud and on our hearts, praying the prayer he taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is easy to offer our money and our gold, but God desires our hearts and our lives. Even as we offer gifts in the offering plate this day, let us reflect on how we might give our hearts and lives so that others may know the truth of God's wisdom and love. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the gifts we bring be gifts of love. May the offerings we share be offerings of our hearts. 
May each gift be blessed by your grace, that others may know the truth of your wisdom and your love. Amen. Our gospel reading for today is from the gospel according to John, the second chapter, verses 13 through 22. And I'm supposed to have you stand for that, aren't I? Oops. Y'all, stand if you're able for the gospel reading. I'm learning. If you want to follow along in your pew Bible, it's page 923. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign have you to show for us, show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And those that are watching, don't forget to comment in the comment section so we know you're there. Now, I know all of us have pet peeves. They may not be the same thing, but we have little pet peeves that get on our nerves. The thing, you know, that raises our ire and blood pressure every time. How about people who buzz by you in the fast lane on... 74, and then move over in front of you and immediately slow down. This usually happens, it happens to me right after I've sort of set the cruise control just at the right speed, you know, a little bit faster than speed limit, but not so much faster that I probably will get a ticket. Even if I did, it wouldn't be reckless driving. I keep it down a little bit. Or how about the really dander-raising breach of freeway etiquette? When you and 9,000 other cars have dutifully merged over in the left lane and are in stop traffic because the sign says right lane closed ahead because of construction, and then you see this car just zip right past you so they can merge in at the very, you know, right when the lane closes. I know, you know, part of me just wants to sort of block that lane. I see some tractor trailer trucks do that, sort of block it so people can't whip around. That just gets to me. Another one that gets to me 
is when it's pouring rain and people have their windshield wipers on, but they forget to turn their headlights on and you can barely see them. I'm just going to say that. But I don't get angry at anyone, you know, to, that they know it. But it's just annoying. There's, and each one of us probably have annoying little things that d just probably only register as blips on the seismograph of injustice. These are just things that affect us personally, but not permanently. That's why we call them pet peeves. But there are other events, other issues that we witness or read about that just reach out and wrench our souls, not just our time schedules. The circumstances that reek of wrongness while resonating with tuni the tuning of our own temperament, these con they constitute our hot button. You know, we react almost without thinking. Something to think about. What sets off your hot buttons? Maybe it's seeing a soured, surly adult start to berate and then beat a slightly whiny child in the grocery store. Or it's overhearing or being party to a cruel, gossipy conversation aimed at hurting a friend. Or is it catching a poacher taking aim at a protected animal? Or seeing an elderly woman being bullied by a gang of bored street kids? If a hot button has really been hit, you don't even think about the consequences of your actions. Before you know it, you've stepped between the adult and child, broken into the conversation, shouted a warning and spoiled the shot of the poacher, given your arm and your smile as support to the elderly woman. Each of these hot-button responses potentially can put you at serious risk. So real is the possibility of danger that we are carefully schooled in how to avoid such confrontations, how to disarm our hot buttons. We've invented agencies and institutions and proper authorities. Don't let your hot button discharge. Instead, put the right telephone buttons on. Call child welfare, social services, the state police, 911, but don't get involved yourself. That's what we've been taught. Could it be because we don't allow ourselves to react to, to these truly hot button issues we encounter that then we pour so much overreaction into these carefully nursed pet peeves? In May of back in the early 90s in Seattle, a young man was driving home from a party and he pulled out and passed a slower moving vehicle. Well, incensed by this insult, the driver of the slower mo moving vehicle chased the young man for several blocks. And when he finally caught up with him, he pulled alongside him, fired six shots at the young man. Now, although struck by three of the bullets, the young man was somehow able to drive himself to a nearby hospital emergency room and so survive. But should that have even happened? And I know we can name things that we read in the paper and, and maybe we become immune to it. Our social disciplining has tried to train us to let these big issues just sort of roll off our back while we spend all our energy sweating the small stuff. <coughs> what about those citizens in a foreign country an ocean away you can almost at any time in the past years, you could name a country. People being massacred in the name of ethnic cleansing. Oh well, surely the government will do something about it. But take your new sweater to the dry cleaners and when you get it back, your buttons, the buttons you bought that sweater for because you just loved them so much, are all gone. You hit the hot button, you raise the roof, you threaten a lawsuit. 
Well, Jesus took a precisely opposite approach. Jesus was a master at keeping the nagging, time-consuming, energy-sapping details of life at bay while he focused on what really was important. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? Facing this enormous, excited crowd, Jesus gave all his attention to preaching and healing and teaching about the coming kingdom of God. The disciples, they were the ones fussing about when and where the next meal was going to come from. When arrested on trumped-up charges and tried by a kangaroo court, Jesus faced tormentors who tried everything to get a rise out of him. They taunted him, they mocked him, they spat on him, they hit him, they humiliated him. But they never succeeded in denting his dignity or cracking his composure. Jesus didn't have any hot buttons to go off when it came to protecting himself. But this story that I just read you from the Gospel according to John, it demonstrates that Jesus definitely had hot buttons, hot buttons that could be pushed. Confronted with this busy, bustling scene at the temple courtyard, Jesus was suddenly struck by the futility of all the activity going on, the waste, the deception, the manipulation of God's intentions for selfish human purposes, the terminal sickness of this religious system hit Jesus smack in the face and lit up his hot button. Jesus got whip-cracking mad, mad at the temple for being turned into a marketplace, mad at the money changers who had turned a holy obligation into a lucrative profession. Mad at the Passover pilgrims who saw the temple as a place to transact a business deal, not to remember God's holy works and feel God's holy presence. Mad at the priests who had let their love of law and ritual take precedence over their love for God. Mad at all the pointless sacrifices that caused the temple Mount to swim with the innocent blood of animals instead of a shrine with the living spirit of God. E.P. Saunder called Jesus' whip-cracking action a symbolic occupation of the temple. The sickness of the religious system hit Jesus' hot button so hard that he reacted instantaneously without considering the risk he might be running. Jesus was trying to bring the divine presence back into his father's house. The temple had become nothing more than a slaughterhouse, a trading house, and a party house. Jesus had to clean house in order to once again make room for God's spirit. Now let me ask you, do we still have the ability to get whip-cracking mad for God's sake? What needs to be cleaned out of our establishment religions and, and bureaucratized institutions in order to once again make our churches places where the Holy Spirit glows and breathes its life into all who worship Jesus. What is important to make this a living community, a place that we reach out to one another, that we care about what's going on in people's lives, even more so than we are now? Where can we go? Lent is a time, I know traditionally we've heard that Lent is a time for giving things up, but I like the idea of adding things, adding spiritual things to our lives, creating new disciplines that strengthen our witness to others 
of the love of God. What do we want to make a difference in? Whether it's here in our church, whether it's how our church is viewed in the community, whether it's ministering to the individuals right here in Anson County. Each one of us has gifts and different gifts. We have different schedules, different abilities. As our life goes on, our abilities change. But I think as long as we're living, breathing individuals, there is always something that we can give to God, that we can do to share God's love with other people. What are you going to do to bring breathe new life into our church, our community, our world. Amen. And our hymn is Lift High the Cross. Please stand. wonderful to be able to look out at your faces during this worship service and maybe there'll be more persons come as they feel more comfortable I hope we can get back to more and more activities that we can do together because it does it is important to see one another if we can
hear this benediction. Blessed by God's wisdom, we go forth refreshed and renewed. Called by Christ, we go now to serve. Amazed by God's love, we go now to love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.